Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name's Laura. I'm an alcoholic and an addict. And, um, well, let's see, I'm going to start at the beginning. Um, when I was a kid, like you hear most alcoholics say, I never felt comfortable in my own skin. I always felt loneliest when I was in a crowd. Um, and none of these things made me alcoholic. Some Something in my brain, you know, made me an alcoholic. But um, these things didn't help any. I grew up in a middle class family and um, I was loved very much. But my father was a raging alcoholic, a very angry, raging alcoholic. So I had a good example on, you know, how to start my career of drinking. And as I said before, this didn't make me an alcoholic either. But, um, you know, it's just one of the things in my life. Um, I had extremely low self-esteem. Um, I liked to drink at a you know, young age. And um, I liked to dabble in drugs, too, as a teenager. And um, a conglomeration of these things led to me getting myself pregnant when I was 17. Um, I married the dad. And we started this marriage with a lot of love. But... Both of our um, our addictions pretty much killed the love within a couple years, and um, our marriage became a very scary place to be. Um, I left him after a few years, um, took my son with me, and my poor son was kind of be- bewildered by this life that he was watching. You know, his parents lead. Um, I was not a good example to him. Um, Two, three months later, I met my second husband, (laughs) and he and I both like to drink a lot. And um, that's, we pretty much centered our relationship around um, alcohol for the first few years. And um, I got pregnant with my daughter, stopped while I was pregnant, but the minute she was born, you know, it was off and running again. And I went to rehab. And we ended up quitting for six and a half years. And these were awesome years. But I ended up having a back backache one day. My mom gave me a pain pill. And then that led to me thinking, well, if I can do that, I can smoke pot. And well, since I'm smoking pot and controlling it, I guess I can control my alcohol now, right? Uh, wrong. So um, I ended up, we ended up drinking and just indulging in all of our addictions again. And I ended up in 2009 going to my first psych ward and being 5150 because I just could not stop. And I didn't know what else to do. And that led me to stop for maybe a couple weeks, maybe a couple months, but off and running again. And um, this went on for years. I've been 5150 I three or four times, um, but this last time I ended up going to detox for two weeks, and I knew I was I was done. I knew I couldn't keep doing this, and so um, I ended up getting the opportunity to go to a wonderful rehab called um, Olympia House in Petaluma, and I stayed there for for. 30 days. And for the first time in my life, I got real therapy from a real, a real clinician. And we kind of delved into a lot of things about myself. Um, A lot of, I gained a lot of self-knowledge and I came to understand a lot of things that had been so fuzzy and murky to me before. And I was incredibly lucky because my husband also quit drinking and using. And by the end of our career of drinking, we were also doing coke and meth. And I was seeing bugs everywhere. And just life was scary. So the gift of him being sober and me being sober, this has been incredible. My sober date is um, Valentine's Day. 
um, February 14th, 2020. So I just hit my one year. And life has gotten so much better. Um, I couldn't have dreamed of how happy I am now. Um, you know, life isn't perfect. It's not always, you know, rainbows and unicorns and pink clouds. There's real stuff. We have real problems, but we're learning how to deal with them. Um, I have a sponsor. My sponsor has a sponsor. Um, if there's anybody new that's wondering about how to get get a sponsor through Zoom, you know, because it's kind of hard doing it this way. Personally, I just said during a meeting, you know, hey, I need a sponsor. And I was contacted by somebody. And I was lucky because she's been an awesome sponsor. She's got um, 21 years of sobriety. And she's been taking me through the steps. I'm just starting step eight. And step four was incredible. Um, it was so difficult, but it led me to understand so many things about um, problems I've had with people and what my side of the problem was, what what my part was in everything. And it was it was like doing therapy. Um, it took me months and months and months to get through it because I was so thorough, but it led to an incredible amount of self-knowledge and it was so incredibly rewarding. Um, these days, well, at the end of my drinking career, I was pretty much disabled. I'm diabetic and I've got neuropathy and um, carpal tunnel in both hands and the daily pain that I was going through was horrible. My doctor had me on a steady stream of Percocets, um, which really did not help with the pain issue in the long run. Um, I think it just actually made things worse. But um, the, the point is, I was pretty much bedridden um, because of the pain. These days, um, up and about during the day, um, I'm doing Instacart to help my family make extra money. I'm thinking about getting a full-time job again. Um, and this is something that scares the crap out of me. But, you know, it's, it's growth. It's what adults do, right? So... Um, yeah, my relationship with my mother is completely changed. I don't have to lie to her every day um, like I was before. She knew something was up, but um, I'm a good liar when I want to be. And, you know, I told her, oh, no, mom, I'm still not drinking. I'm still clean and sober. And there was something in the back of her mind going, ah, but, you know, like I said, I was a good liar. Um, at the end of my drinking career, my 20 year old daughter who, who lives with us was not speaking to me. She hated me. She would not have even come to visit me at rehab, except her father needed a ride. Um, but I've worked hard to show her how much I love her and how sorry I am for all the things that I've done. And I'm lucky she's forgiven me. And she and I have an incredible relationship now. Now, my son um, hasn't spoken to me in two years. And that's something that something that I'm going to start working on with step eight. And that scares the crap out of me. But, you know, I love my son. Um, I do want a relationship with him. Um, and I'm at nine minutes, but I, I think that's pretty much all I have. Just if you're new, keep at it. It gets better. It gets so much better. Um, you know, just keep working on it. Get a sponsor. Do the steps. And life gets better. And I'm out. That's it. And <laughs> thank you guys very much. Hello, everybody. <laughs>
I'm Krylon. I am definitely an alcoholic. Uh, I, first of all, I want to say, Laura, that was an awesome share. Thank you so much for sharing your experience, strength, and hope, and congratulations on getting one year. That is an amazing feat. Um, and welcome to in, all the newcomers. Um, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous, and um, congratulations to anybody who might be celebrating any form of a milestone. What an awesome thing, you know. We do that so that we can show that the newcomer that it that it works, but also to remind ourselves that we are on this journey, you know, that it's not over, that this journey is still happening, that it's it's about the journey, right? I my sobriety date is December 25th, 2004. I got sober in Berlin in Germany. And um I'm originally from San Diego, California. Um, I took my first drink there. I don't remember my first drink, but I, I do remember the first drunk I had, or rather the morning after that drunk. <laughs> I remember that very well, you know. Um, and I initially took that first drink because I didn't like the way that I thought and I didn't like the way that I felt, you know. I didn't like the things that I thought and I didn't like the way that I felt. And um, I didn't want to take a drink because I had seen people taking drinks around me in my life and the way, it, the, the way they reacted to drinking. Um, I just didn't like it. I didn't like it. You know, I didn't want to be like my dad, who was a big old drunk, you know, um, and I saw a lot of male, male men in my, in my family and in my neighborhood. I grew up in, in um, you know, a pretty rough part of San Diego. Um, and um, I saw those people take drinks and I saw them beat up people and beat up women and all this stuff. And I just didn't want to be like that, you know. Um, and I held out as long as I could. And that was 12 years old. <laughs> you know. Um, and eventually the screaming in my head of how how um, how horrible of a person I was and and how everybody's going to find out that I'm gay and how, you know, um, and how I'm never going to be anything interesting in my life and I'm not going to be like all my friends. Eventually, I took that drink, you know, because they were, my friends were taking a drink and I saw it changed them in a different way than it changed my, you know, my, um, my, my, my family, the older, the adults, right? So I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to try it. And I took that drink and I got what I needed. You know, I got what I needed. I got that relief from the crazy in my head. And, and, um, and it was off to the races after that. You know, I, um, I immediately started hanging out with people who drank hard and partied hard. And um, I dropped out of school, and went back to school and dropped out again. And, you know, I, um, I had consequences, but I didn't even care too much of the consequences because for me, it was about escaping out of that family that I lived in. It was about escaping from those people that neighborhood and straight into like the fantasy world or the world that I can create on my own, right? And so I did, I did, and I ran with it and I became a club kid and and then eventually San Diego became the issue. And I'm like, I have to get out of here. I got to go to New York. I got to go where the people are, where the, the, the it is. I need to go where the it is because the it is not in San Diego. I need to be amongst the artists because now I'm an artist, right? Now I'm like this amazing artist. And I had to be in the place that amazing artists exist and drink like amazing artists drink and, and you know, listen to the music that amazing artists listen to. And it was all about me creating this persona that had, was driven without like alcohol was driving that, you know? Um, and I was, I felt like I had to drink. I had to, I'm Krylon. I have to drink. It's part of who I am. Right. And, um, if I didn't do that, then what would I be? What would I, you know, what do I do? And, and, um, and I moved to New York city. I moved to New York city in the nineties. I became a club personality. I was doing all kinds of, you know, stuff in New York and, I remember when I got to New York City, I, I drove across country with my friend Sean. We drove across country in her her Mustang. And I remember reading the Celestine prophecies as we went across country because I was always a little wooey, right? And um and I remember um getting to New York and saying, New York can finally start. I've arrived. I've arrived in New York. New York can start happening now. I'm here. I give officially give New York permission to happen now, you know. And I stepped out of that 
Mustang and straight into a pile of dog shit. And I hope, so I'm, I'm trying not to use profanity, but that was my introduction to New York City. New York was like, yeah, well, whatever, cry line here, you know, just step in this. And I remember immediately, you know, thinking I'm going to just try to get it together, get it together. That was always the thing that was on my, on the forefront of my mind was like, I have to get it together. I have to sort it out. I got to like, you know, figure things out. You know, um, if it was just the right combination of uh, things in my life, then I will be able to get it together. Right. And, um, and eventually New York became the problem, you know, and um, the excuses started to, to manifest. And it was the excuse of, you know, um, I just don't have what all of these other artists have. I don't have the secret to being an artist like these other artists have the secret to being an artist. I mean, I'm, you know, messed up enough. I drank enough, you know, I'm completely, you know, fat shit crazy enough. Like, why am I not like the rest of these people? Why am I succeeding and stuff, you know? Um, and I just drink and think and drink and think and, and eventually the thinking got so loud that it was so hard for me to drink it away. But I kept trying, I kept trying. Every time I picked up that drink, I kept trying to drink away the thinking, you know? Um, and um, it just kept getting louder and louder and louder. And eventually New York became the problem. And I moved to Montreal. And, um, and then I, I moved back to New York, met some guy when I was in New York and um, who was from Germany. Um, and um, actually, I met him back in San Diego when I was visiting, but I went back to New York. And that guy, you know, I met him in San Diego and went back to New York. And I remember, um, I remember him wanting me to move to Berlin and to, to be with him. And I had no idea about Berlin. I knew there was a wall there at some point. And I, I knew that there was all these like fascist people there. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to move to Berlin, but I've never been to Europe. So I just decided to give it a go. Maybe New York, or maybe Berlin was the answer, right? So um, I packed up, got a, I got a, um, uh, my passport, flew to Berlin, you know, got to Berlin in around 19, the end of 98, the beginning of 99. And, um, and I landed in Berlin and I told myself, like I always tell myself, I'm going to focus this time, focus, 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 focus and get it together, you know? And I took that drink and that drink took a drink and that drink had a drunk, right? And um, and I just could not get it together. I used, I, you know, it's so funny. I, I used to think that it was the last drink that got me drunk. I was convinced of that. It wasn't until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and I found out it was the first drink that got me drunk because it kicked off the phenomenon of craving. It kicked off that where I could not moderate once I had alcohol in me, how many drinks I was going to have and what I was going to do as a result of it. I had no idea, you know? Um, and so I, um, but I also had no defense against it. I did not know how to not drink. I did not know how to not pick up the first drink. Um, and then, and you know, when I got to Berlin, um, I, I got into the theater and I got into the club and I got into a band and I was in, I was all punk and all that sort of stuff in Berlin and I was in the art scene and, you know, it just got darker and darker and darker and darker and darker. And I just could not get out of that darkness. Um, and it just got, it was like this heavy blanket of doom that just like it's laid on top of, and I had no idea how to get out of that, you know? I, I drank away that, that relationship and we wound up getting a divorce. Um, and I moved into a squat with my dog, this punk squat in this area called Friedrichshain. And, um, I started stealing beer from the squat, you know, um, uh, my ex partner, he was, he had, his family had a bit of, of money, so he was taking care of me, you know, um, even though we weren't together because he was still, I guess, somehow responsible for that um, as far as we weren't completely divorced yet, you know? Um, and um, yeah, he had to pay for my, my health and all this other stuff. But I, I wound up, you know, I, I wound up meeting an artist at a bar that I was working at and she, um, she pretty much 12 at me. She was in the rooms of AA and she pretty much 12 at me. Now it's so interesting. The first time I actually heard of Alcoholics Anonymous is when I lived in New York city 
And some of my friends were disappearing from the bar stools. And I was like, oh, what happened to blah, blah, blah? Oh, they're, they're an AA. I'm like, what is this AA thing? What is this all about? You know, um, I knew then that, um, that whatever it was, I didn't want to catch it. Whatever it was, I didn't want to catch it, you know, because I was terrified that it would do something to my drinking, you know. Um, and so I, I sat there and I listened to her talk about a little bit about how she was sober. And, and, um, and when me and my partner broke up and I lived in the squat, I eventually had to find a place to live. And she came up to me and she told me, she's like, you know, Kryolan, you can live in my place because I'm moving to Paris. Um, but I'm going to lock my stuff up in the basement because you're an alcoholic and I don't trust you. And I was absolutely offended. Now, I, up to that point, I would hang out with all these people who drank like I drank and we'd sit around and be like, yeah, we're big old alcoholic drunks, woo, 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 and all this stuff to make fun of ourselves and everything like that. But when a sober person came to me and told, called me an alcoholic, I was suddenly offended. I was absolutely mortified. and um. And it was because this person saw me in a way that the other people didn't, you know, saw me for who I am and saw my truth. And, um, and I was terrified of what that looked like, you know? Um, and so I moved into her place and, um, and, um, yeah, the last year of my drinking looked like this. It looked like me butt naked in front of the computer, drinking red wine, looking up conspiracy theories, just freaking myself out. It was the Illuminati and it was the Freemasons and it was all these things, you know, I was terrified of that. I was so terrified, you know, and my brain just got louder and louder and I could not drink it away. And I got to this place of desperation and I didn't know what to do. You know, I did not know what to do. It was like my life was on an endless loop of doom. I didn't know what to do, you know. Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't crash a car because I didn't have one. You know, I didn't lose a house because I didn't own one. You know, there's a lot. I've never went to jail or anything like that, you know, um, but by absolute sheer luck, because there's times where I should have been thrown in jail for sure. You know, a lot of things that didn't happen to me. But the things that did happen to me happened to me on a level that I was absolutely 100% done with. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I was over being over it. I wanted something different. I wanted a change in my life. And I didn't know, I did not know how to do it. I was powerless over my mind and the crazy that was happening inside of it, you know? And so she came back from Paris and, and on Christmas Eve, I, I, well, day, yeah, Christmas Eve, I asked her if I can go to a meeting with her. Chris, no, the day before Christmas Eve, I asked her if I can go to a meeting with her, and she said, yeah. And Christmas Eve, I woke up next to a contortionist, and I remember we had, um, I, he had Baileys and coffee, and I hated Baileys, and I couldn't stand coffee. And from that day to this day, I haven't touched any kind of alcohol. And, um, and by the grace of God, I don't have to ever pick it up again, you know, um, by the grace of God, one day at a time. So, um, I went to a meeting that night and I heard what I needed to hear. I heard that I never have to drink again <clears throat> and it blew my hair back. It absolutely blew my hair back. I was like, because the way that everybody spoke, the words that people used, how they formulated their words was everything I've ever thought in every way I've ever felt in my life. And I could never enunciate it so clearly as I heard when I went to at my first AA meeting. And to this day, alcoholics still speak that language, you know, and that language comes from the heart. It comes from a place of truth. And I'm super grateful that I've connected with that, you know. Um, and so, um, yeah, I wanted what you people had immediately, you know? Um, and I asked this guy, I'm like, so what do I do now? You know, cause I was crying and I was like, oh my God, I can't, I'm an alcoholic and a just realization. And this is what this has been all about this whole time. Like, this is what this has been about, you know, like, and he's like, I asked this guy who shared a story that I absolutely connected with. And I said, what do I do now? And he's like, well, you know, you keep coming, you keep coming back. I'm like, okay. And I'm like, and what else do I do? And he's like, you keep coming back. You get yourself a sponsor. 
you work the 12 steps in order, you get yourself service commitments and you just, you know, do this one day at a time. And I'm like, okay, I want you to be my sponsor. I've never had a sponsor before. I don't know what that's all about. And he's like, well, do you sure you don't want to go out and do some control drinking? And I'm like, I don't want to do any kind of, I have no control over my drinking. I de- if I drink, I'm getting drunk. You know, I want to be able to not drink tomorrow. Help me not drink tomorrow. I can't do this. And please help me not drink tomorrow. And he's like, okay, well, what we're going to do is we're going to work the steps, you know? And so I started working the steps with him and I got a service commitment, you know, and he told me to pray in the morning and pray at night. And so I did, you know, um, one of the first things that came to me was, um, I used to be terrified of the dark, terrified. You know, I thought like, if there was, if I turn off the light, that's it. I'm it's the boogeyman or whatever it is, is going to come after me. What do I do? You know, I don't know why. I mean, it's 30 years old. I was still terrified of the dark. Um, and, um, he told me, he's like, well, why don't you turn off the light? You know? And I'm like, I have never slept without a nightlight on. He's like, why don't you just give it a try, pray and just give it a try. And so I did, I turned off the light and I prayed and I fell asleep and I woke up that morning and my mind was blown. Nothing happened. It was the first, very first evidence for me that the problem was centered in my mind. And the book talks about that. It says that we believe that the problem of the alcoholic is centered in our minds. So we can't go to our minds for the solution. You know, that's, that's that part I added. We can't go to our thinking for the solution because it just perpetuates the problem. We need something greater than ourselves. That prayer of help. And that was pretty much all I could pray at that time, you know, and then I fell asleep and woke up the next day and nothing happened. It was that simple. It was showing the insanity was centered in my mind and that physically I was totally okay, you know, and I get to remember that on a day-to-day basis. And so I did, you know, I did all 12 steps and I kept doing, you know, I keep doing them. I moved back to the States um, and, um, and I had my first resentment in New York City. Woo! My first real resentment. I mean, I had resentment in my first 30 days too. Trust me, it wasn't like I came in and woo, everything was fine. I mean, my my very first, like, I feel like my very first service commitment was taking everybody's inventory, right? But like, um, honestly, what I honestly, um, you know, that honest, like cringeworthy resentment was when I went to my first, you know, gay meeting, which was in New York City. Um, and some old queen said something to me and I got so upset and the old Krylon would have just went over and just read her, her filth, just absolutely tore her a new one. Right. But the new one was like, the new Krylon was like, Oh, okay. They say pause when agitated. So I'm like, let me get out of here and go call my sponsor. I tried to call my sponsor. He didn't answer the phone. There was some old guy sitting next to me, you know, near the payphone. I turned around, I screamed at him. I don't have any money. He said, I didn't ask you for any. And I was like, Oh my God, I just yelled at this person for absolutely no reason. I tried to go to work. I got there late. They told me to go home because I was working at Whole Foods. And I'm like, oh God. And that's why I went to this meeting space called, called Perry Street, right? And I go to Perry Street and I sit down in front and I'm like, okay, you know, I'm going to raise my hand and I'm going to talk about it. And I'm going to just like, you know, and so the meeting started and nobody called on me. And I walked out of that with an even more resentment. And I sat in front and I'm like, I'm going to cry and cry. And they're going to come over to me and say, oh, Krylon, what's wrong? What's happening? Are you okay? So I'm sitting out in front and I'm crying and nobody came up to me and said anything. And then the, the thought came to my mind. I'm like, you know, what? forget these people, forget this stuff, you know, just to hell with it all. Right. And I'm like, I'm going to go into a bodega. I'm going to buy a beer. I'm going to cuss at it, yell at it, tell it how it's ruined my life, how it's ruined everything about me. And I'm going to pour it out and throw it in the trash. And then the thought came, why don't you pray before you do that? And I was so upset. And I'm like, oh, help, you know, the willingness was so narrow, but help came out. And I walked into a bodega and this is one of those things in AA that just, you know, it just blows my mind. But I walked into a bodega after that simple prayer of help. And there was no alcohol in that bodega, not one ounce of alcohol. And I walked over to the counter and I asked the guy, I'm like, excuse me, where's your beer? Where's your alcohol? He's like, oh, we don't sell alcohol in here. 
and I just burst into tears. I burst into tears because it's the middle of the West Village, the heart of the homosexual New York City where cocktails flow freely, and there was not an ounce of alcohol in that bodega. Blew my mind, you know. And so I, um, I bought a ginger ale and walked out of that you know, I was crying and crying. He's like, oh, well, they sell alcohol around the corner. I'm like, no, you don't understand. And I walked out of there and walked straight into this guy that was in my home group. I was at the 12th Street workshop at that time. Um, and um, and I threw myself in his arms and I started crying. And I'm like, oh, my God, I almost relapsed. And he's like, well, let's go get a cupcake and talk about it. So we walked over, bought a cupcake, and we talked about it. And what came to me is that, A, I have never bought a beer and threw it into trash. And went out a day in my life. B, that was evidence of a power, absolute evidence of a power doing for me what I could not do for myself. Because I was powerless over the thought and I was entertaining, you know, trying to make it, you know, like sort of rearranging the story so that I can have permission to buy this beer. And the crazy part about the story is that I'm not in control of where it goes, right? It's like the thought turns into the story and then the story turns into the belief and then the belief turns into an emotional response to the thought. And I am not in control of any of that. I need something that's, that's going to stand in between the thought and the belief, you know? And that prayer of help was that direct message to a power greater than that thought and totally arrange, rearrange that thought, you know, totally rearrange my entire reality, really. And so I'm super grateful for that. Um, you know, I've done, oh, I only have 10 more minutes, right? So <laughs> let me get to where I need to get to, get to where it's like now, because there's a lot I want to talk about now. Um, you know, I, um, I moved to California. I mean, I have, I, I lived in San Francisco for a really long time and I love the Bay Area Fellowship. You know, um, I've done, I, I've done a lot of stuff in the Bay Area Fellowship. I have tons of sponsees that I sponsored there. And, and, and now I live in Los Angeles and I have sponsees that I sponsor here and I have my sponsor here. You know, I have a life that I never thought I could ever have. I, and I, I've become, I've done music with, other people in the rooms and traveled all over the world doing music and performing and all this other kind of stuff. You know, um, I have a partner now that I absolutely love and I have a life that I can actually be proud of. Right. Um, which was not my story before, you know, and if you would have told me at like day one that I was going to be what I'm like at, you know, 16 and some odd years, I wouldn't have believed you. I would not have believed you. As a matter of fact, when I came in and they started reading the promises, that was, I was like, don't you, don't you even, don't even try to promise me that I will be able to handle situations that used to baffle me. I will be, have, you know, be able to handle financial stuff and all of this other stuff that I've never been able to do. Don't you promise me that. I was so pissed off. You know, I was like, how dare you? And, but I kept going, you know, because that the sponsor at the time was like, you know what, but just keep coming back. Don't worry about all of that. You know, just stay in what is, you know what I mean? And so I did, I kept coming back, you know, and I told him, I'm like, if none of those promises come true, I'm coming back to Alcoholics Anonymous and I'm burning this bitch to the ground because you don't fuck with my emotions like that, you know? And he's like, you know what, Krylon, just let that go and keep coming back. And so I did, you know, and slowly, slowly, but surely the promises started to manifest around me, you know, beside myself, beyond me. I just, it just started to happen. Um, and so what I do today, you know, what I do today is I talk it out instead of think it in. Cause when I talk it out, I get it out. When I think it in, it stays in there and you know, it manifests, turns into fear, panic, worry, anxiety, you know, um, I don't what if anymore. And I was doing that. I was doing that in the beginning of the pandemic. I was, what if I get it? What if somebody else I love kids? What if people die? Like, you know, what if, what if, what if, what if? And I was sort of like went back to one of the old timers in Berlin that used to say, cry on, it's not about what if, it's about what is. Because what is is what's real, you know, to so stand what if, what stand what is instead of what if. What if is fantasy, you know. Um and um 
I learned that, you know, when I change the way I look at things, the things I look at change. So I get to change the way I look at a problem today, change the way I look at what I'm experiencing today, you know, um, try not to immediately jump into conclusions, try not to immediately go into the story. You know, I still have a brain that has a thought that creates a story and turns into a belief. So I still get to like go back to like, wait a second, that was a thought that turned into a story. Now I'm starting to believe it. And I know it's not true. So I get to go back into that whole, let me give this all over to my higher power thing, you know, because my higher power is a power greater than that story, you know. Um, whew, you know, being present, I learned, is not an event. <laughs> You know, it's not like, oh, today is present day, you know, being present is not an event. Um, my mind wants to create a separation from reality and, 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 and the act of living in it, you know, sending me to this place of fantasy and the feeling of slowly dying in fantasy, right? But I am and I have always been physically present. No matter where I mentally go, I'm physically here, right? And it's just a matter of accepting that, just accepting that this is where I'm at. I don't have to time travel into problems that are invented by where the problem is centered, you know? This is all step work stuff that I get to do, you know? I get to do the step work, continue to do the step work because my thinking doesn't stop thinking. I continue to do that step 10 inventory so that I can continue to maintain a power, a connection to a power greater than myself, you know? Um, my favorite steps is three. I love step three. I love all of the steps, you know? Step four, clearing away the wreckage of my past. Like literally we find and remove those things that block us from a power greater than our thinking, you know? Six and seven is amazing because it's about like those character defects and, you know, not, relying on them again and when they pop up immediately asking my higher power to remove them so that I don't have to entertain stuff that kept me sick you know I don't have to live in that sickness anymore um and then once I ask my higher power to remove them then I act as if they're already removed and I act as if they're already removed so that I, my ego doesn't try to play like some sort of like game with me anymore you know because the ego thing doesn't like me to live in the present moment you know what I mean? It either wants me in the past or the future, you know? And um, so I, that ego deflation is all about, for me anyway, in my experience, is that acting as if thing, you know? Um, um, I always say, God, help me to mentally show up to where I physically am, you know? Um, recently, there was this whole thing, and this is this, is this really interesting thing. I, I had spoke to one of my sponsees about um about a fear that had come up or this moment of fear that came up and um and that moment of fear was i turned on the news and they're like oh there's this you know this meteor thing that's going to be flying by the, you know the earth and and suddenly i turned a flyby into a catastrophe right i'm like oh no this is it this is it and I had to be reminded of the words that I just heard and not creating new words that aren't real, you know? And, um, and I remember talking to my sponsee about it. And as I'm speaking about it, I got this sense of like, oh yeah, that's right. That's the, that's the thing in my head, all of a sudden rearranging words and turning it into stories that weren't even spoken out, you know? Um, and, um, and I can do that with people too. I can like, if a person says something to me, I can rearrange what they say and turn it into something that is offensive to me. And I'm like, oh, but that's not actually what they said. You know what I mean? I don't have to read in between what they said. I have to, all I get, to, all I need to do is just listen to the words that's spoken and take it in as it is and not manipulate or rearrange them in order to, you know, go into this place of fear and worry or anxiety you know um you know and in the beginning of the, the pandemic when i was going through all of that worry anxiety i had this i had a new revelation i had this new thing with this that was power greater than myself and i started praying in a different way you know and i started praying to a different energy that i never prayed to or that i used to pray to 
before and I started praying to again. And I found that it's just the name, you know, um, that whatever power I give behind that name is what drives that name, that, that connection to that name for me, you know, and it's been so, it's been super beautiful. Um, and that's what I've gotten out of the pandemic for me. Right. Um, and there's so much else that I can talk about. And I, I actually don't know where I'm at with time. Um, but I, you know, I, I can say this, I can say that if you're new here, please just keep coming back, um, set aside everything that you think you know about what you're going to learn at Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, that, you know, I, I don't do it perfectly. Oh, I have five minutes. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> I don't do this perfectly. And I'm super grateful that perfection is not a requirement for membership in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's about spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. If I'm sitting in spiritual perfection, I don't even see the spiritual progress, you know? So I got to go to the journey, not the destination. What I'm finding is that the change happens in the journey, not at the destination, right? So I get to set aside that ego. I get to set aside that resistance. You know, I get to set aside all of those things that it, that keeps me from hearing what I need to hear or saying what I need to say. You know, I got to set those aside and so that I can continue to grow. That's what that whole room to grow thing. Like I'm not done growing at, at by any stretch of the imagination, you know, and I've also learned that a smooth sea has never made a good sailor, you know, so uh, there's going to be rocky, rocky roads ahead and that's okay because as long as i continue to sail i'll get to continue to learn how to sail those rocky roads you know um and life is the miracle of life is just living it as it is for me today you know um i do a lot of yoga in the mornings um i do a lot of meditation in the mornings um and i do those things because that's my medicine you know i need that medicine today um and yeah, I have a really amazing relationship with my, my mom and my dad. And I want to say this thing before I go to is, is about my my nine step amends, because that's another one of my favorite steps. You know, um, I love, I love all the steps. But my nine step amend, the first one I did, I did it in San Diego. And um, I, um, you know, it's so funny. I did a lot of I did a lot of geographics is what we call them you know, when I was out there drinking and I learned that where it doesn't matter where I go, there I am. And I bring the problem with me. I bring the thinking with me. So I could have gone to the end of the moon and just to hide, but I'd still brought me with me and I'd figure out a way to fuck that up. Right. So, um, it's all about having that higher power, but in my sobriety, I did several geographics too, but I, every city that I went to, I went straight to Alcoholics Anonymous and, and stayed sober, you know, you can go anywhere and do anything, just continue to do this and stay with this and stay in the middle of the herd, wherever the herd might be. Right. So I remember, um, doing the ninth step amends and I remember, um, having to make amends with my dad and I hadn't seen my dad in a million years. I didn't know if he was alive or dead, you know? Um, and at that point, to be kind of honest with you, I didn't really care that much, you know? But I had to make those amends and I was working at Whole Foods in San Diego and the, the day I got on my dad's name in walks my half sister, my dad's daughter, and I went up to her and I'm like, oh my God, you know, God shot, coincidence, whatever you might call it, you know, being in the right place, doing the right thing, knowing that you're on the right business. I remember she walked up to me. She's like, oh, my God, it's good to see you. And I'm like, it's good to see you, too. Where is that? Is he OK? And she's like, yeah, he doesn't live that far away from here. I'll give you his number. And I called my dad and we decided to meet up, he picked me up in his pickup truck. And we decided to meet up and, and I made them into him the exact way that my sponsor had me do it. And he turned around to me and he said, you know, I'm super proud of you. And you know what? I'm also sober. And I mean, I just started crying again because you can't make that kind of stuff up. You know, dad was an absolute drunk in the disco era, like kind of, you know, and it was amazing to have him sober. And so we formulated this beautiful relationship and we still talk to this day after not talking for all those years. Right. Um, and I remember right after doing the nine step amends, I was walking down the street on the way to band practice and I decided to stop and hug a tree. I don't know why I just did, 
I was in that one of those moods, right? And I'm like, oh God, what if people laugh at me because this random person is hugging this tree? And I'm like, oh, but they said, take contrary action to your extraordinary thinking. And my thinking saying, don't do it. So I'm going to do it. So I went over to this tree and I hugged this tree. And I remember like, nobody said anything or anything like that. But after I did, I turned around and I looked at this rose and I'm like, what if that rose is this absolute evidence of my higher power telling me that it loves me because it's so beautiful. And I'm like, oh my God, maybe it is. And then suddenly it was like, I saw, I love you everywhere. And then I'm crying again. And I'm like, oh my God, God loves me. Look at all of these beautiful things it did for me in order to let me know that it loves me. And I called my sponsor and I'm like, oh my God, God loves me. <laughs> he was like, welcome to your spiritual awakening, you know? And it's like, and it, it was so beautiful because it was such a, it was such a, like, it was that spiritual change, that psychic change, right? That change from like, you know, the universe or God conspiring against me to God actually conspiring for me, to help me, you know? Cause it was always like, I don't want anything to do with me. And I'm like, God, it wants everything to do with me. And it's so amazing that it was simply acknowledging that, that it wasn't something that wasn't already happening. It was just a matter of changing what the way I looked at things and the things that I look at changed, you know? And, um, and I have to keep that open mind to continue to do that, you know, to continue to move forward and to continue to look at things different. So the things I look at change, you know? Um, and I, I, I also have a therapist, so I do a lot of therapy and stuff like that. Um, and I go to a couple of other, you know, programs, but I think that I'm all talked out and I'm super grateful. Once again, thank you so much for letting me share. Um, and, um, if you're new, please keep coming back and yeah, that's all I got. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.